Is it necessary that a pastor go to seminary? That's what we're going to talk about today on Conversations with a Calvinist, which begins right now. Welcome back to Conversations with the Calvinist. My name is Keith Bosky, and I am a Calvinist. Today in the studio with me, I have one of my best friends in the whole world, Pastor Aaron Bell. Hi, Aaron. How are you? Hey, Keith. I'm good. How are you? I'm very good, and I'm excited to have you on the program, even though I will say I've been doing this for over a year, and this is the first time you've been willing, as one of my best friends, to actually come on the program. I got people that don't even like me that have been on the program more than you. You know, I'm... <laughs> I'm not sure what I have of value to add to the conversation, but we'll see. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm excited. And uh, pa- uh, Aaron is the pastor of Redeemer Church, uh, Redeemer Community, Community Church. Church in Yulee, Florida. And uh, he was formerly the worship leader at an amazing church. Phenomenal church. So, <laughs> at our church. He was the worship leader at Sovereign Grace Family Church for several years, and God called him into ministry. And when Aaron uh, felt God calling him in that direction, we got together, we talked, we prayed about it, we went through uh, a time of, you know, discussing what it was going to be like and how it was going to change his life, because before then, you you actually had a pretty successful career in the automobile industry. Yep, absolutely. I worked in service and parts in the automobile industry. Yep, and so you came to me, and I want to go in the ministry, and the first thing I said was, you you understand, this is going to be a major financial life change. Yeah. And am I correct? Yeah. Yeah, Okay. Absolutely. (laughs) Uh, Because, you know, uh, only, well, I was going to say nobody goes in the ministry to get rich. There are those who do go in the ministry to get rich, but typically they're not true shepherds. Uh, A true shepherd is not going into the ministry to get rich. He's going in the ministry because God calls him to that, and he has the purpose in his life to to proclaim the gospel and to teach and to preach and to shepherd lives. And uh, that may not be something that has a lot of financial rewards on this side of glory, uh, but certainly we have uh, we have the Lord, and He is our great reward. So, uh, but I did, you know, I had an opportunity when you got ordained. Mm-hmm. I think that was one of the things that I told you mm-hmm. was, you know, this is this is a this is a, a life of service, and it's a life of sacrifice. Mm-hmm. But uh, but I'm thankful to have you as a brother in arms, and uh, and and to have been played a small part in in your life in in that regard. Yeah. So thankful. Thank you. So what we're going to discuss today is the concept of seminary, and um, I think as a listener to this program, you probably know what I mean when I say the word seminary, but just in case that's a foreign term or maybe something you're not familiar with, a seminary is basically a college for pastors, and seminary usually comes after a time in college, uh, like a doctor who's going as a medical doctor would have to do his degree and then go into medical school. Mm Uh, a uh, pastor would normally do his degree in a, in a Bible college of some mm-hmm. some kind, and then go into seminary. Seminary being the postgraduate work, mm-hmm. or, or graduate and postgraduate work. So, uh, you went for uh, your MDiv, correct? Which yep. is a what kind of? Because that's not a standard. That's not one people are used to hearing about an MBA or something yeah. like that. What's an MDiv? So an MDiv is a Master of Divinity degree, and at most seminaries, it's about a three year long program. So. When you think of a master's degree, a lot of times that's an MBA, which is 18 months typically. So it's about twice as long as most other master's degrees, but it's the step before a doctorate degree in ministry work. And in a, in a lot of ways, it, I think it, it's it's very close to what a, a, a other doctorates would mm. have to do. I mean, would, would you... Would... In some ways, yes. Some seminaries will require a, an MDiv uh, candidate to finish like a thesis Mm-hmm. And have a, a you know similar to how you'd present a doctoral dissertation, a little yep. bit shorter in scale, but certainly it is probably more challenging than average master's degree, but less than a, a full doctorate. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, when you first came, and we talked about you going to seminary, mm-hmm. um, I, I, I'm gonna I'll, I'll tell the world, <laughs> uh, I was I was actually I tried to get you to stay here mm-hmm. and do the seminary. Uh, through the correspondence, which mm-hmm. I guess now is an online correspondence. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so to call even correspondence is probably not even the right term anymore. To do it online, yeah. because uh, you know I wanted to work with you and I wanted mm-hmm. you to work here, but you felt very strongly about going, 
and, and I don't have any hard feelings. If just in case that sounds like it's kind of, just in case that's, we're like, over we're, it now. We're, we're yes, better. We're I, okay. No, uh, I, 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 I loved working with you. Mm-hmm. I still, again, enjoy our yeah. friendship and and our our opportunities like today to just sit and talk together. Um, and and you were a wonderful worship leader, but you felt like going was of great value to you. Mm-hmm. And can you tell me, I'm going to ask this in two parts. First, can you tell me what was it, what was the draw that you go? Mm -hmm. And after you went, do you feel like you, do you feel like it it did what you thought it would do? Yeah. So you remember the process was really complicated. I mean, we talked together for over a year about me knowing that God had been calling me to more into full-time or to vocational ministry and started looking at seminary, wasn't sure what the options would be. You know, I was in my thirties. I had a successful career. I had two sons at the time. And so packing up and moving away wasn't appealing in a lot of ways. And so we looked at the different options and the opportunity came for me to go to Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, but we were still looking at going online and with um, what they call intensive courses, where you do some online coursework, and then you go and you sit in lectures for one week solid, and you you basically knock out all of the lectures for a course in a single week. Mm -hmm. And so um, when I signed up, that's what I signed up to do, because like you said, we had a wonderful relationship. You had been a tremendous mentor and um, guide to me. I grew in my faith and in my ability to minister so many ways under your leadership. And Neither of us wanted that to end. Um, So I signed up for two of those intensive courses. And the first time I went to Southern um, was in the middle of summer. I took a class called Personal Spiritual Disciplines with Dr. Don Whitney. And I took a class in Baptist history with Dr. Tom Nettles, who was, Mm -hmm. had just really retired from full-time teaching. He's, he's still teaching in some capacity, but I took what was potentially one of his last Baptist history classes. Nice. And, um, I got up there the first week and sat in class the first day, and it was so different than what I imagined. I expected a very rigorous academic environment. Obviously, Southern is uh, a place where some of the best scholars of our day are um, serving, and so I knew that there'd be a lot to learn from those men. I'd read some of their books. I knew who they were. What I did not recognize, and I got there, was these men were all very much pastors as well. And Mm -hmm. their their teaching wasn't just teaching the academic side of things, but they were really making efforts to raise up men to the ministry, care for their souls. And so really the big thing I was afraid of losing when I left here was the relationship we had. And it gave me a lot of uh, comfort to know that it wouldn't be a replacement for what you and I had, but I would be under the care of men who had the heart of shepherds. And so, and I also knew instantly because I'd done some online coursework before that week, there's such a vast difference between watching a video of someone, even with all the latest technology where it can be interactive versus sitting in the room with them, being able to converse with them one-on-one. I mean, just like today, it's far better for us to be sitting here together than, you know, just connecting across Zoom. We'll yeah, and and that's part of the reason, and not to change subject, but that's part of the reason why we built the studio mm-hmm. here, uh, so that we're able to do interviews like this. Zoom mm-hmm. is is it's like Brady Bunch style, <laughs> you know, you got right. everybody's face, and yeah. you're sort of who's talking, who's you know looking around. So yeah, there's that, and then of course, um, I, I've talked about this. We have a, we have an academy. I'm going to mention this later, mm-hmm. but we have an academy here at the church, and people ask, well, can I do it online? I say, yes, mm-hmm. you can, mm-hmm. but it's not the same. It, there, there really is. Even if you're not necessarily interacting with the lecture, there's just a different feeling. Yeah. There's a different attentiveness mm-hmm. when you're in the room versus, and this the same goes for sermons as well. People who talk about, well, I'm gonna, I'll catch the sermon online. It's right. not the same. It's mm-hmm. never, it's never the same. Um, it, Brother Mike Collier, one of our elders, he he talks about preaching as an event. Mm-hmm. You know, he says yeah. when we preach on Sunday morning, it's an event. It's a it's it's a moment in time that God is giving this grace for this moment. Mm-hmm. That's not to say that the 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 recorded message can't go forth and and ex- sure. and, and be used by God. But there is a time that God has mm-hmm. set aside and a place and a and a, and a, and a mm-hmm. purpose for that. And I, and and so not to not to necessarily equate what you do in the seminary class with what we do on Sunday morning, but there is a sense in which yeah. being there. Yeah. is is very important. It's really similar because you're grateful for the technology that allows us to do that, yeah. but it's not a replacement for 
being face to face. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. So while you were in seminary, though, you were not not serving. I know that's a double negative. <laughs> you can take that for what it's worth. Uh, <laughs> uh, you were you you felt the desire to serve at a church when you were in Louisville. Uh, is yeah. it, did I say that wrong? Because people in Louisville is it Lou, <laughs> people get real upset. Listen, there's a huge debate about Louisville, Louisville. Just don't call it Louisville, and you'll be okay. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, we, we went to uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and honestly didn't feel a desire to serve. You know, I had been working full-time outside of the church here, serving as worship leader, uh, doing a lot of things, and we thought that we were going to go to seminary and focus on the academic environment for several years and that we would settle into the background of a you know large, healthy church and focus on school. Um, but God had really different plans for us, and... It's hard for me to overstate how significant this was to my seminary experience because as much as I loved Southern Seminary and the professors, really what shaped me most was uh, I ended up meeting a guy the first week I was in Kentucky. Brother um, Brad, right? Brad Walker, yep. yep. And a few months after we met and a few months after I landed in a new place where I knew no one with my wife and children, um, we planted uh, a church in Jeffersonville, Indiana, which is just across the river from Louisville and uh, we planted Redeemer Church there and and honestly yeah I may be jumping ahead but it it was born out in my life again that seminaries cannot produce pastors they mm. can teach and train a lot of important things but pastors are made in churches and Amen. that was my experience here I was already being shaped for that before I moved to Kentucky and then obviously being in the midst of planning a brand new church um, while also being in seminary full-time and working full-time, everything I was learning in seminary was immediately being put into practice or exhibited in the life of the body. And so it, it kept it from being overly academic and detached, which is, is really one of the dangers of seminary. You can learn how to exegete texts and not have them impact your heart, and that's a danger mm. for every man in ministry. So um, God's plan was for us to go there and plant a church, and we didn't know that when we left here. Um, but I'm so grateful for it because, honestly, without that, the experience would have been totally different. If I would have just kind of half-heartedly participated in a congregation and kept myself detached from the life of the body, I, I don't think the seminary experience would have been nearly as beneficial. That's awesome. That's a, a, a and that's that's thoughtful for a lot of guys because there may be some who are watching who are thinking of seminary mm -hmm. and maybe they're thinking that they're going to spend two, three, four years or even more mm -hmm. if they're going for a doctorate. You know, throughout the program that I'm gonna I'm gonna separate from the church and mm -hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna be in the you know Ivy covered tower and, mm -hmm. and do the do the school thing. Yeah, and 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 for you it wasn't that way. No, and, and not because I was intelligent enough to have that forethought. God's providence kept me from that error, really. Yeah. And, and I think that if you go to seminary and get comfortable being detached from the church and just approaching it as an academic exercise, mm. in three or four or five years or however long, you're going to have a real hard time getting back into the life of the body because you and I both know as pastors, life in the body is not always so simple. That's right. And it, it's easier to study it theoretically than it is to live in it practically. Yeah, so. absolutely. Well, your, your seminary experience mm -hmm. is quite different than the experience that I had. And um, I wanted to talk about this because, again, there may be some of you out there that are asking this question. Maybe you feel God's calling you in a ministry, or maybe you're God's calling your, your husband in a ministry. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're a, a lady watching this and, and God's calling your husband or... Uh, or you know someone in your church who's who's you, you can tell God's working on them and you don't know what the direction is and and there and, and one of the first questions that comes up is is seminary necessary and we haven't mm -hmm. answered that question yet and and that's an intentional thing we're going to deal with that later but but the reason why I'm starting the way I'm starting is I wanted to say that the the answer that we give is actually going to come from two men who have both had much different seminary experiences, mm -hmm. but both did attend seminary. Mm -hmm. So that is what we're giving you is not necessarily a biased opinion, but is an opinion with experience mm -hmm. because we both do have experience and they're so different. My experience is this: I was in I was in this church, even though it was a different name church at the time, and my 
my desire was to preach. I preached my, I preached my first sermon on the Sunday after 9-11. I've told that story before. And um, God confirmed in my heart that that was what he called me to do. Uh, I wasn't called to sell cars or to lay asphalt, some of the many jobs that I had before <laughs> that. And um, I, I'd been married for a couple of years, had been saved for a few years at that time. And I realized uh, that you know God is, God is calling me to do this. So my initial thought was I'm completely inadequate. I do not have the education because mm-hmm. at that point I didn't even have – uh, an undergraduate degree. Mm-hmm. I didn't have any degree. I had a high school diploma, which I graduated <laughs> with a solid 2.5, uh, which is right in that meaty part of the curve. <laughs> right at the top of the that, bell curve. That's yeah. right. I was I was a terrible student uh, in high school. I was great with extracurriculars. Mm-hmm. I made hundreds in all of the band and chorus and all of the street, performance. Street magic. I was a street magician. I was prof- that, that is not a lie. I was a professional street magician. So all of those things are true, uh, but I was, not an, I was not an academic. Mm-hmm. And once I got saved, God gave me a love for his word and a desire to preach his word, but I did not feel adequate at all. And so I, I said, I need to be instructed. And, and, the, and the problem was, and I, and I say this, I don't think anyone would contradict me, anyone who was here at the time, the church... <clears throat> which was Forest Christian Church at the time. There was a pastor who was here, and he had been to Bible college. Um, I don't know if he went to seminary, though. Mm-hmm. I know he was a graduate of Johnson Bible College. Mm-hmm. And he went on, he was a businessman who became a pastor. Mm-hmm. So his experience was not deeply theological, and neither were really his sermons. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't feel like I had a, a strong mentorship here with him mm-hmm. to be able to say, okay, this guy can train me to do this. And so I felt like I really needed to go outside, and um, but I didn't feel released to leave the church, like to mm-hmm. go find another church. So I went to the only place I knew, which was Jacksonville Baptist Theological Seminary, which is a small seminary here in Jacksonville, which was actually, uh, there was a Luther Rice Seminary mm-hmm. here. Luther Rice closed, mm-hmm. and the men who graduated from that seminary, Vernon Johns, Jerry Powers, and Stanford Cruz, all came together and created Jacksonville Baptist mm-hmm. Theological Seminary. And so it was like, and this is, we discussed this before the program, it was like pastoral trade school. <laughs> and that's the best way I can describe mm-hmm. it. Because first thing, when I met, you know, met with them to discuss becoming a student, I, I realized that it did not, it did not have the same accreditation mm-hmm. as a university or something like that. It was accredited like a trade school. It was accredited uh, uh, by the, the Florida Department of Private Schools and Colleges, mm-hmm. which is not like SACS or something like that, right. which is a regional. ATS, yeah. which is the big theological accreditation. No, yeah. it wasn't accredited through that. So, um, but, it did, but that didn't matter to me because what mattered to me was I wanted to learn. Mm-hmm. And also it was something I could afford mm-hmm. because the, the seminary was, you know, when you look at some of the bigger seminaries, the, there, there's a lot of investment there. Yeah, Sometimes absolutely. people have to take out massive loans to be able mm-hmm. to accomplish that. This wasn't that. Mm-hmm. The The credit hours were <clears throat> very reasonable, and the church actually afforded it for me. So the church paid mm-hmm. for me to be able to go. And so I never had to pay. And they, and they had an undergraduate program, mm-hmm. which was... Because again, what this seminary was designed for, it was designed for men who were most likely already in ministry mm-hmm. and wanted to get a degree, but didn't have the ability to go to Southern or go or leave their family, leave their home, go do those things. Most of the men I was in class with were like 40s, 50s, and 60s, mm-hmm. where I imagine yeah. you were probably in class with a lot of younger. Yeah, there were a few guys my age and mid-30s, uh, a few older guys, but the vast majority of them were, you know, 22, 25, 27, Coming out of Boyce old. as well, right? That's right, coming out of undergraduate. A lot of them had just finished their undergraduate degree and come straight to seminary. Yeah. And, and yeah, Boyce College is a four-year undergraduate school that's on the same campus as Southern Seminary. Yep. Um, so, yeah. I, so I did my undergraduate through the seminary. Mm-hmm. I then stayed and did my bachelor's and my, or I'm sorry, my master's and my, my doctorate. Mm-hmm. At the same time, because I was concerned about accreditation, and this is just for side note, uh, I, I, I did an additional degree. Mm-hmm. I have a degree in social science with a minor in education 
because I felt like if the church was ever not able to meet the needs of my family, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wanted to have a degree that would allow me to teach, because mm -hmm. I felt like the only other thing I would want to do, the only other thing I felt equipped to do was to teach. Yeah. And uh, by God's grace, that hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was a substitute teacher for a, a while, but that was just to, to supplement income. But I've never had to have a full-time yeah. The, the church has always met my needs full time, which is a, a tremendous blessing. I can't can't express how much I'm thankful for that. But so my so my experience, I was working during mm -hmm. the day. I was working at uh, at the time at First Coast High School. I was a paraprofessional. I was going to class in the evening, and I was serving the church mm -hmm. uh, during the week and on the weekends. all the other times. Yeah. Yes, all yeah, <laughs> yeah. And in that respect, we had really similar experiences because I, I was working outside the church as well. So the difference for me was I kind of corralled all my classes into Tuesday and Thursday so that I could go work Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. The Lord provided a job where I could work four days a week and, you know, be able to be a part of the church on Sunday. Um, and you're serving in ministry Sunday, so you're really working seven days a week. It, it, was, a, it was a difficult and trying season, but, you know, even uh, to point out what you said, God provided for us in so many ways. I mean, we made it through seminary at a, at a place that, you know, certainly was not cheap. Um, but by God's grace, you, the church and you and many other faithful folks here encouraged and supported us financially, and we made it through. But your story brings out something that I think is really key in this conversation, which is you and I both assessed where we were in life when God called us to ministry. We both were at kind of different stages. I was older at the time um, and kind of already career and all that stuff. Um, you were a little bit younger, but already pastoring a church, right? And so that was a heavy influence. Well, I, not when I went into seminary. Okay. I was 21 when okay. I preached that sermon. The oh, very next right. year, I was 22, I, I became a student at, at the seminary. I got ordained um, after I got my bachelor's, mm, okay. and then the church called me. Yeah. I was still working on my doctorate. Okay. After I became the pastor, I was okay. in seminary when I became the pastor, gotcha. but I had already been in seminary for a few years. Yeah, but but that's I, I, that's really a key thing is for a man who feels like God's calling him to the ministry. <clears throat> you know, you need to assess where you are and not follow some prescription that you found on the internet mm, that amen. says this is exactly what every pastor must do. It, it's not in the New Testament, right? I mean, that's an important thing for us to examine. The New Testament doesn't say thou shalt go to seminary or thou shalt not go to seminary, because there are plenty of folks who would say, oh, the seminaries, you know, they're terrible. They produce men with puffed up heads, but, you know, cold, dead hearts. Yeah. Uh, there's an anti-intellectualism that a lot of folks look to and say, well, you know, all I need is the Bible and the Holy Spirit. Um, and we would speak against that and say, certainly you can do that, but training is helpful and beneficial. And, you know, whatever God has uh, laid before you open the doors for, you ought to pursue that in, you know, in accordance with the spirit and where he's leading you. Yeah. I, I have my Bible with me. I just wanted to mention one particular passage because this was on the door of my seminary as I was, um, as I was in the class, I would see this every mm -hmm. week or every every uh, every couple of uh, days because I had Tuesday and Thursday classes as well. And um, make sure I'm in the right place here. Yeah. Now the ESV doesn't say it the same way the King James because <laughs> it's not as strongly inspired as the King James. <laughs> that is a joke. But just <laughs> uh, the ESV in in, in Second Timothy two fifteen. It says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Now, the King James, as I remember it, because again, it was placarded over the door of the seminary, it says, study to show mm -hmm. thyself approved mm -hmm. unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Shoe thyself. That's yeah, that's what, to, to shoe, shoe, thyself. shoe thyself. That's right, S-H-E-W. <laughs> Uh, to to uh, yeah st study to to shew thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing mm -hmm. and and our good dispensationalist friends really hold on to that one <laughs> I'm just I'm just saying that's a, that, that yeah. it was a disp and and that is the thing it was a dispensational school so they would often point right. to that dividing the word of truth right but that verse was sort of in a way the foundational verse for the seminary, mm -hmm. that we are called to be men 
who are diligent. I think that's mm-hmm. the New American Standard says be diligent mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. show yourself approved. Um, this one simply, of course, is do your best to present yourself. Um, but to rightly handle the word of truth is our responsibility. Mm-hmm. So as a man of God who is called to shepherd the people of God as an elder in God's church, as a pastor in God's church, we have the responsibility to rightly handle the word of truth. Therefore, the question of, is it necessary that a man go to seminary? Mm-hmm. My answer, and, and you tell me your thoughts on this answer, maybe maybe you'll say it better than I will, but this is a, a way that I would say it. I would say the requirement is not seminary. The requirement is that you rightly handle the word of truth. Mm-hmm. And if a man is able to do that mm-hmm. apart from seminary, yeah. Then that then 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 praise the Lord. Yeah, I think that's a super helpful framework for thinking about this question because y- you can then ask yourself seminary whether it be, you know, a big well-known accredited seminary, a local seminary or pastoral training academy inside a church or you know myriad online resources, can this help me? Mhm to be a man who can do this? Am I going to grow in that ability through this tool? And and can I do this thing while still honoring all the other responsibilities God has given to me? So that could be a family, a wife, children, providing for them. Because the other thing we see a lot is some guys get so fastened to this idea of going to seminary, and it's got to be an accredited seminary, that they neglect their God-given responsibilities and put the burden on their wife and children mm-hmm. And so that they can do this thing when really they could have attacked that from a different angle and still been faithful. God may provide the opportunity. He did in my case. I'm so grateful for that, um, to do that while, you know, not perfectly, but to the best of my ability with God's help, being faithful to my wife, to my children. Um, but it's not worth sacrificing that for either. Sure. And and, that, and that's a good... And perhaps maybe we have you come back another day and talk about uh, the role of pastors' wives mm, and the yeah. elder's wife, and, and maybe one day we could fill the room and put yeah. both of our wives beside yeah, us, and we could just have it. We could tighten this area and have mm-hmm. us all uh, snuggled and, and talk about that. That would be weird. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but we could talk about their role yeah. because uh, I know this: if my wife had not supported me. From the very moment mm-hmm. that, in fact, she was the first one who said to me, God is calling you to preach. Yeah. She, mm-hmm. it wasn't even me asking her. Uh, she knew that, that God had, um, you know, had, had, had gifted me mm-hmm. to do this thing. And, and she said, you know, this is, this is what God has for you. And, and, and then my question is, well, is this what God has for us? Yeah. Because yeah. you are going to be here too. Yeah. You know, you're going to be working alongside of me as my closest friend, as my faithful, you know, uh, you know, partner in many ways. And though her burden is, n- she is not an employee of the church, and, mm-hmm. and we, we make that very clear. Mm-hmm. Um, she's still, of course, uh, like any man's wife, has the burden of sort of shouldering when I'm, when I'm struggling, mm-hmm. she knows it. When I'm yeah. weeping, she is not unaware. And when I'm frustrated, she knows. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, there's a lot that, uh, yeah, we could. That, well, and, the, you know, not to go too far down that road, but that's another important consideration for especially a married man uh, who thinks God is leading him to ministry is what preparation is there going to be for your wife in that? You know, we were blessed. Again, there the Southern has uh, Seminary Wives Institute, so Allison was actually able to go and participate in some classes because – while she was always supportive of me, many times she said, I'm not sure about being a pastor's wife, right? I, mm-hmm. I don't know what that involves. Am I ready for that? And, you know, I had a great confidence in her and who God made her to be, but um, she was able to take some classes uh, somewhat less formally, but still the same professors, the same men I was taking classes with and their wives were investing in the wives of men who were being trained for ministry. And that's made a profound impact as well. Nice. Uh, in preparation. So if you're a man who's thinking about this and you have a wife, it, it may not be that you have to go to a seminary that has that, but think about how are you going to help her be prepared for the life God's calling you to as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's that's a good word for sure. 
Well, let's let's take a step back and let's talk about the subject of accreditation because mm-hmm. I think we've 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 agreed that seminary is not absolutely necessary. I mean, mm-hmm. I serve with two men who are faithful, mm-hmm. uh, God loving elders, pastors, yep. and and when we are all three. Uh, in a sense, we we share uh, an authority here as mm-hmm. as pastors in the mm-hmm. church, and and we work together uh, as as ministers. And I'm the only one who has a formal uh, education, yeah. but Brother Andy has um, you know many years as mm-hmm. a, as a as a pastor in a church where he was the he was the lead pastor at uh, at, a, at a church in in Middleburg, mm-hmm. and um, he did that without formal seminary mm-hmm. training. Brother Mike uh, was an elder at a previous church, is an elder here now, and he does not have uh, any formal uh, training. Both of them, though, are uh, voracious readers. Mm-hmm. They both are, mm-hmm. they, they, you know, Brother Andy consumes, he's always telling me about what mm-hmm. he's reading. Brother Mike consumes so much in their reading. Mm-hmm. And it's like this, someone once said something about Spurgeon not having formal education. I say, yeah, but he read all the time. Yeah. At a scale you and I couldn't comprehend, really. I read somewhere it was six books a week. Some insane number, I'm sure. And the only other person I've ever heard of anything near that would be your uh, uh, president of the seminary you went to. Yeah, Dr. Moeller, yeah. He he has, a I think, a special gift for consuming information. What was his... You told the story about his bookshelves. Can you... Yeah, so um, at the presidential residence uh, the <laughs> seminary the white house uh, <laughs> he has visited the president yeah. the white house so, of uh, southern so after seminary. graduation you go over and you get to you know dr moeller and his wife miss mary who are both extremely humble and gracious uh, people you know greet you congratulate you they walk you down into his library which is essentially the basement you know up in the north they have these things under your house called a basement here in florida we don't we don't have that but here in florida we're afraid of them because yeah, well, they're wet we, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to swim yeah. um but it's you know it, it's a library of who knows how many thousands of books and i think if i recall correct there's like two full-time librarians who work in that private library because it's wow. you know it, it's big it's not like you know five bookshelves and uh, on the stairs going down are stacked, uh, as I understand it, all the books that, you know, are coming to him, the things he's going to read next. And they're stacked by the dozens. And each staircase, I think, represents like a month's worth of reading or, you know, what he's tackling next. But um, he is a God has given him a phenomenal gift for that kind of capacity. And if you get in a conversation with him and ask him a question, he's very likely to say, you know, so-and-so's recent work on page 158. So I don't know if he sees it visually to recall it, but he can almost quote you, you know, by paragraph, sentence, and line what he's read. And so, uh, yeah, if you have that kind of ability to consume information and understand it, then maybe seminary is unnecessary yeah. for you. Um, <laughs> exactly, yeah. I mean, I mean and, 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 and you wouldn't have to have that to say seminary is unnecessary. Yeah, but, of course. But, yeah. But, 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 yeah. Absolutely. That's, <laughs> Extreme example. Yeah, but that would be the Spurgeon mm-hmm. picture. Right. right, but Spurgeon, who didn't have any formal education, felt led by God and felt it important enough to create a kind of a training yes. system for young men called to the ministry. And so he, you know, obviously, even though he didn't have it, he didn't devalue it. Sure, and and, and, and very clearly, definitely don't want to do that, and that's not, not at all uh, what we're having both gone, mm-hmm. you know, we could both say, I, and, and, and I said it earlier, I knew I needed it yeah. because I was, I needed to learn how to study. Mm-hmm. And in fact, that was probably the most valuable thing I got <laughs> was not the information, but how to acquire the information. Uh, when I first got, when I first said I was going into seminary or going into ministry and going into seminary, I had a man I was at a karate seminar. And he was a karate friend, and he goes, "Oh, you don't have to go to seminary. I can get you ordained over the weekend." <laughs> and, and 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 he was being very kind because he thought no, ordination's no not a thing. You know, ain't no thing but a chicken wing. We go down to give you a hockey chop and a and a and a, and a, and a, and a certificate of ordination. And he was very he was being very serious. Which color belt do you get with the karate ordination? Uh, it would be your uh, it, chartreuse. <laughs> Actually, purple with the vestments. That's you know, right. Purple yeah. vestments. Yeah, yeah. But no, you know. So, and I told him, I said, "That's, I said, that's very gracious. Mm-hmm. Thank you for for offering." Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm not going to seminary because I need that forward nation. Yeah, I'm going to seminary because I feel the need to learn how to study because I don't feel like I was taught that in high school. Yeah, and that and that is not a shot at my teachers. I think I had some fine teachers. Mm-hmm. They just had a really bad student. 
<laughs> and and, and yeah. I'm willing to admit I was I had no interest in in learning how to acquire you know I knew mm-hmm. how to study magic I knew how to mm-hmm. I knew how to I knew how to adopt and, and retain information but I didn't care enough mm-hmm. to to do it mm-hmm. in the scholastic in scholastic sense mm-hmm. so going to seminary helped yeah and it's interesting you mentioned that we didn't talk about this before but I would actually say that was probably in all the things seminary can teach you the thing I learned that I needed the most was the ability to study as well. And, and I, I was not a good student. I always had good grades, but I never felt challenged in school. And so that's, he's, he's, I, that's a rib. That's a rib. No, no, no. I mean, <laughs> I didn't have. So, so I got to seminary at 30, 32 or 35 years old. I don't recall now. I was in my 30s and I got to seminary and I did not have good study habits. And I had never really had to study anything in depth before. And then along came Hebrew. Mm-hmm. Um, and it kind of rocked my world. And so... You know, they write right to left. <laughs> the business is it, that. Listen, it's <laughs> reading hieroglyphics backwards. Um, it, it's not an alphabet. It's, it's paintings. Uh, <laughs> it may as well have been Japanese, and it's upside down and backwards. And... I got to it and it challenged me so intensely because anytime I had needed to learn anything before, I'd been able to just cram it in, pass a test. Well, that wasn't going to work. I, I mean, circuits in my brain had to rewire themselves. Mm-hmm. And, and um, again, God was gracious to me. Uh, I met a man who was studying in my same Hebrew class from Nigeria, who English was not his first language. He was a pastor in Nigeria, um, a wonderful encouragement to me. And he was struggling as one might imagine, learning Hebrew in English when (laughs) uh, his primary language was not English or Hebrew. And he asked me to help tutor him. And I thought, well, this is funny. This is the blind leading the blind. I was, I was drowning in Hebrew and, but the process of trying to help him helped me and helped me develop those study habits. And so I came away with, you know, with a degree from seminary that hangs on the wall that like you said, doesn't mean, oh, now I'm qualified to be a pastor, hmm. but it represents what God taught me in that process, which was how to study, because that's what we do, right? Rightly dividing the word of truth doesn't just happen. We don't sit in our offices and you know put our Bibles on our head and sleep and hope it all filters in. You have to put in the work to study and prepare and, and be ready and make sure you understand what you're trying to teach to other people. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So <clears throat> when we talk about the subject of accreditation. Mm -hmm. Um, We have mentioned earlier, I mentioned the seminary that I attended was not accredited. Mm -hmm. Uh, Obviously, Southern is fully accredited, Mm -hmm. uh, and a seminary degree from Southern would be recognized in the same way that a a degree from any prestigious college Mm -hmm. would be recognized Mm -hmm. in the sense of if you you were to go uh, and you wanted to teach at, say, a higher education facility mm-hmm. if you wanted to teach it. Well, well, this Let me ask, because I don't know the answer to this. Let's say FSCJ mm-hmm. or F, uh, uh, UNF mm-hmm. were looking for an adjunct professor. Mm-hmm. Would you be able to qualify for that with your degree? Typically, a professor in a university would have a doctoral degree, a PhD. Okay. Um, okay. There are occasions where you see men with an MDiv or a DMIN teaching in that level, but they're less common. So... Uh, but that, well, let me say this: If you got a degree from Southern, a doctoral degree, you could yeah. teach there. Sure. Yeah. I okay. mean, uh, obviously, in the field of study, right? If they needed comparative religions or something like that, I, they wouldn't hire me to teach biology. I don't think. But, yeah. No. No. I, um, I, yeah. But yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah. You know. I, I remember this when I went to work as a substitute teacher. This was before I got my four-year degree mm-hmm. from the uh, from the university. Uh, which at the time was Ashford University, is now the mm. University of Arizona Global Campus. <laughs> go whatever the mascot is. <laughs> I really don't Arizonians. Know. Yeah, go Arizonians. Globally. Yeah, the global Arizona. <laughs> okay. So um, before I got that degree, I uh, applied to work as a substitute teacher. Mm-hmm. And a substitute teacher in Nassau County does, did not at the time have to, I don't know if they do now, but they did not have to have a degree. Uh, you just made less if you didn't have right. a degree. And I said, well, I do have a degree. It's from the seminary. And they, when they looked at it, they said, um, 
unfortunately, it's not accredited. Therefore, mm. it won't give you the pay raise increase mm. that you would get. They would still hire me, but they wouldn't right. give me that. You didn't just so, write accredited on the bottom. <laughs> no, I could say, look, I it's say, accredited. It says so right Pastor here. Pastor Vernon John signed this. <laughs> this is important. The Pastor <laughs> the, Vernon Johns. The Dr. Vernon Johns, <laughs> who was, uh, uh, side note, Always looked like a pastor. Mm. He had the profile. He had the perfect... grass in a suit and tie. <laughs> yes, he did. He had a perfect <laughs> hair, perfect mustache. Looked like Jack Van Empey. I don't know if you mm-hmm. remember him. Nope. Perfect suit. He was a televangelist, but he just looked like a pastor. And yeah. And I, here we are looking like this. <laughs> <laughs> I wore a pink shirt <laughs> with a... Uh, well, anyway. The, uh, the, the reason why I bring that up is um, accreditation for me, mm-hmm. I knew if I ever wanted to teach... In, in, in a school, if I, you know, like I said, if the church couldn't meet my needs mm-hmm. and I needed to have a, a tent making degree, and that's what some people call it, comparing what Paul did when he made tents to be able to provide for himself during ministry, uh, my tent making degree was a, a degree in education, you know, a, a major in social science, minor in education, which allowed me to be able to teach things like social studies, you know, I could teach uh, history, things like that mm-hmm. in school mm-hmm. uh, at the, at the, um, middle and high school level. Right, yeah. And if I wanted to, I could go for another 12 to 18 months and I could mm-hmm. get a master's in mm-hmm. history or a master's in social science or something like that, and I could go on mm-hmm. to to teach at higher levels if I wanted to. But again, it's at this point, I don't see a benefit yeah. to it. But I understood the difference, especially when that happened to me. Right. I understood the difference right. between accreditation <laughs> and non-accreditation. Sometimes it's got to do with uh, how far you're going to get in a field. Right. If it's accredited or yeah. non-accredited. So what do you say to a man who comes to you and he says, God's calling me to ministry? And this is mm-hmm. your opinion. I, mm-hmm. I, I, yeah. I know that both of us are going to share our opinions. Man comes to you and he says, I want to, I, I want to go to a uh, seminary because I feel like God's calling me to ministry, but I don't know whether I should choose an accredited mm-hmm. seminary mm-hmm. or if I would be just as good going to... And there's a lot of good... Non-accredited seminaries, and when yeah. I talk about mine, mine was more like pastoral trade school. I recognize, I recognize the limitations of the school I went to, but there are some schools that have recently popped up, mm-hmm. like Sam Waldron has Covenant Baptist, Covenant, yeah. uh, which is I I think they're working on accreditation, but I don't think I don't know. Yeah, so if I understand right, that you bring up a good school that I actually looked at. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think back then it was MBTS Midwestern. It's changed Baptist its name. Theological so, Seminary, yeah. So and we, it was not accredited. And you and I looked at it together because they had a church program where if your church supported you, they still it, have that. It by was, the way, it was almost free, right, for the student to go, and the church had to support at some level. And yeah, let me mention that if you mm-hmm. are if you are interested, uh, mm-hmm. contact Dr. Waldron or contact the school that. He's the president of. They have a church affiliate program where if the church partners with them, anyone in that church can go to the seminary. At least that's the way it was. And And, I think, yeah, and I think it's now Covenant Theological Seminary. I think is Covenant Baptist. I think. Oh, is it Covenant? I think so. I think so. So um, I looked at that school, and from what I understand. I think the academic rigor is there. So a lot of times people assume that accredited versus non-accredited means less rigorous. Sure. It could mean that in certain circumstances, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. You may get a very rigorous and challenging education from a non-accredited school that the only difference is going to be, again, if you go to get a PhD at an accredited school, you may have to go back and essentially redo that work with accreditation so that you can move past that. And so... I was shaped a little bit by your experience because, you know, you and I had talked and I knew where you were. And I thought then and still think now this is, you know, not a word from the Lord, but I thought then perhaps later in life I would want to teach not in seminaries in American context, but on the mission field to go and train and equip pastors uh, globally. And we're seeing the same thing happen there as well. Accreditation is becoming more and more important even in global seminaries. And so I wanted to have that ability and I didn't want to have to go back and redo the work. And so I went accredited largely for that. And ultimately because God opened the door for us and provided. And had he not, I could have gone somewhere else. I mean, you know, not to puff your head up, but the, the seminary education you got shaped you to be a pastor who have encouraged me and so many other people and, you know, served us in growing into ministry. And so it's not uh, as simple as, you know, this one's good and that one's better, right? Mm -hmm. It it really is about where are you when God calls you to ministry and where is he leading you and being faithful in those opportunities? Because you can study hard in a non-accredited, perhaps even less rigorous environment, or you can skate through 
in a more rigorous environment and get the piece of paper, but it doesn't change what's actually happened to you. Amen. And we talked about this the other day about you can't see 5, 10, 20 years Mm -hmm. in the future, but you can think about Mm -hmm. what do you feel like God is calling you to. Mm -hmm. And if you do feel like God is calling you to something that would require that Mm -hmm. accreditation, Mm -hmm. then looking at it earlier rather than later is probably wise. Whereas, um, you know, I've actually considered, because I do have a desire to teach, and I always have, um, since becoming a, a pastor, I enjoy teaching. Mm-hmm. And so my wife and I have discussed the, the idea, and I've even discussed with our elders here, the idea of me going back and getting mm-hmm. a, uh, even though I have my doctorate, it's not accredited, getting an accredited uh, mm-hmm. a, a degree. That way, other doors might open. Right. But at this point, it's a, it, it becomes an issue of um, the, the why, for me, because mm-hmm. it's a question of, and I'm and I'm sort of bearing my heart with the audience today. But the you know, I am very pleased with what we're doing here at the mm-hmm. church. Mm-hmm. I, I, we're not perfect by any <laughs> stretch of the imagination. We we make a lot of mistakes, but I feel like we are doing a lot of good things in the kingdom and mm-hmm. teaching. And I feel like even this is an opportunity to teach in in many ways. And and so I, I I'm asking myself cost analysis. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. because this is going to be a financial burden. Yeah. If I do, and is yeah. it worth it? Is this is this is this the best way to spend the money in the kingdom? That's right. a question we're yeah. you know. And, and I don't live in this world, so I'm not super current on it. But I know that the the amount of teaching jobs in seminaries is not great. Yeah. And every year, just like in secular fields, we're minting far more PhDs than there are teaching jobs for. Mm. And so there's no guarantee that you get that accredited degree. And a job opens up for you. I think, and I've told you this before, you know, you have a particular gift in teaching. It's always been one of the strongest ways God has used you. And so you have a capacity for that, that if I got a dozen more degrees, I don't have as strong a gift in that specific area as you do. And so um, the, the, that's not to say if you went and got a degree specifically to be able to teach, you wouldn't learn some things. Mm. But I think it illustrates the point that God doesn't need us to have some external qualification to use us in ministry. Ultimately, we're all relying on in ministry the spiritual gifts, right? The, the things that God has equipped us with and the work of the Spirit in our lives to make us faithful. And yeah. so seminary, and, and this was a little bit of a conversation we had before, there's a lot of things seminary can teach you, and there's an equally long list of things seminary cannot teach you. Right. Mm-hmm. Seminary is not a replacement for exercising the spiritual gifts God has given you. Seminary is not a replacement for cultivating a heart for God's word and mm-hmm. for living in obedience. Um, seminary is not a replacement for learning how to be a disciple, right? And growing Amen. in discipleship. Um, it can teach you how to read and exegete a text. And, and you should understand that if you're going to be a pastor, it can teach you original languages, and it can teach you important skills in counseling and preaching and and all kinds of wonderful things. But seminary is not a magic bullet. And and again, to say it, because I think it's just so true, seminaries do not mint pastors. Churches do. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. When... uh... And I and I want to say just how grateful I am. Uh, very kind words. Um, it is funny what you when you first started that sentence a minute ago. You said uh, something to the effect that I don't live in this world, and I was like, he's about to get super <laughs> spiritual. <laughs> yeah. Not of this world. I, that's exactly yeah. NOTW. I got the tattoo. <laughs> He said, I don't live in this world, and you were talking about the world of academia. But I, just, I said, where's he going with this? This is, this is going to get awesome. Actually, from outer space. I'm so sorry. I can't help but want to have some fun <laughs> on the program from, from time to time. Uh, well, I, I want to mention one other thing, and this is where we maybe start drawing it to a close, because I, was, I became convicted about three years ago that I wanted to – Produce an academy within the church, Mm -hmm. and you've mentioned that a few times. Mm Church is raising up uh, ministries or ministers Mm -hmm. from within the church, and that my conviction came on on a couple of points. One, I realized that, um, as you noted, Mm -hmm. there 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 aren't a a lot of opportunities Mm -hmm. in the you know out there as far as you know teaching opportunities and things Mm -hmm. like that and i felt like this is this is something that 
um, our church could be doing is providing mm-hmm. opportunities for learning and even for teaching. And we could do it on a lower level and say, this is not for necessarily the man who wants to become the full-time pastor mm-hmm. or, 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 or anything like that, but this is for people who want to cut their teeth mm-hmm. in an, an academic environment mm-hmm. that is meant to be more than a Sunday school, mm-hmm. but not quite a seminary. Right. And that's sort of where we landed mm-hmm. with Sovereign Grace Academy. We produced a two-year program, mm-hmm. which is eight core classes. We have surveys in Old Testament, surveys mm-hmm. in New Testament. We have church history and doctrine. We have classes on uh, ethics, apologetics. You know, mm-hmm. All of those are part of the eight-week, or it, each one of those is an eight-week course that mm-hmm. has an additional four weeks, so it becomes a, a 12-week total, uh, because the additional four weeks is independent study and writing right. a research paper, and each each class requires a research paper. And I based this actually partly on what I did in seminary, because those mm-hmm. were that was sort of how our classes mm-hmm. were were were, str- were spread out. You spent eight weeks in the classroom, uh, and then you had four weeks mm-hmm. of before you had to turn in your your final project for that class. And I went to our seminary, the seminary that I graduated from, and I said, "Hey, I want to do this. Can we do this and and do this in conjunction?" Mm-hmm. And the first thing the president said was, um, yeah, uh, you know, you have a doctorate from here. We're happy to support you in this, uh, but you're a Calvinist. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Keith Foskey, and I am a Calvinist. There was no doubt that that was the – and so the seminary that I went to wasn't Calvinistic. Mm-hmm. In fact, I was taught in seminary uh, that Calvinism was uh, was not good. Mm-hmm. And, and so – that there was a little bit of a struggle there. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a little bit of sort of a back and forth about how we were going to handle that, and 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 we we got through it, and everything was fine. And so what we were able to do, we we were able to set it up where if you take classes here, mm-hmm. that 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 class would count for, toward credit with mm-hmm. the seminary. So mm-hmm. a person could start here, and if they decided they wanted to go for a degree mm-hmm. through the seminary, they would be able to use the the certificates they earn. Right. For that, yeah. so and, and and like I said, getting back to the conviction on this, part of my conviction is I I I, I do believe, as you have said a couple times mm-hmm. today, that it is the church's responsibility to raise up ministers. Yeah, absolutely. And if at, at 21 years old, when I felt God calling me into ministry, I really felt like that was, if that would have been there. That right. would have been the first thing I would have done. Yeah. I would have spent yeah. two years learning from the pastors who, or the, mm-hmm. you know, if there would have been men here who were who were preaching and teaching the word, mm-hmm. I would have sat under them. Yeah. I would have trained under them, and and I may not have even went to seminary because I would I possibly could have through that yeah. learned how to study, which is what I wanted to do. Right, and and so uh, I do hope that we start seeing more churches mm-hmm. that understand the value of studying. Yeah, and that's a critical ministry that you you know we've talked about it at length, even when you were first conceiving the idea of it. And um, I'm so grateful it's accessible, and it's a great place for a lot of folks to start because they're getting what I got from you before I ever left for seminary was seven years we'd been together, and uh, many evenings we spent in a parking lot together hmm, working yes. and but having Sounded conversations. Weird. Let's clarify. Right, we were we work- did security work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just sat in a parking lot. Yeah. And, um, we, we, uh, we worked in a, uh, uh, we did security for many big events. Yeah, but we got uh, we got to spend time. You were discipling me and shaping me so that I had so much of that already. And when it came time and I felt like God was calling me to this, the first people I looked to was not just you, but our elders in the church to say, do you see this mm-hmm. in me as well? That external call is so important, not just I feel like God's calling me. So to any man out there who's feeling led to seminary but who's not plugged into a local church, that's absolutely step one. Amen. Um, you you need to be connected to a local body, serving. You, you need to figure out what this is really all about because it's not about sitting in a study and you know exiting once a week to deliver a message from on high and then retreating back to it. You need to get in the nitty-gritty. But then something like Sovereign Grace Academy – a two-year process is going to help you test that call. That's right. And find out is this really where God's leading, or or am I just feeling a hunger for more depth mm-hmm. in my understanding of the Word and in my life as a follower of Jesus? So, when God pulled me away to seminary, I didn't know it, you didn't know it, but He was dropping me in the world of church planting, planting the church in Indiana. I came back here to pastor a church that was a plant, you know, just a few years old plant, 
and my desire has been that, you know, in God's timing, we'll be able to plant more churches. And so obviously this raising up men in the faith is very important to me as well. And I approach it only slightly differently. I orient my schedule around, you know, a few guys and and engaging them week after week in the way that you and I did and, and seeing God raise them up and prepare them. But there's going to come a time where, right, that more formal stuff and sending them here, again, because I think it's, it's such a reflection of the gift you have, right? That teaching gift is so strong. And so even it's important for churches to think about working together in communities yes. for this, right? Every single church doesn't need to have the exact same thing sure. so that we can all teach our, you know, tiny little distinctive differences between, you know, they see it this, I see it that way. We can work together for the good of the kingdom, for the growth of disciples. And ultimately you learn that, you know, the hard thing we went through is you're growing disciples to give them away. Yes. And and it's difficult, and, but the, 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 the more they grow, the more likely you are to lose them because God's going to send them out to another part of the kingdom to do his work. Amen, and 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 that's what I would say was the hardest part hmm. with mm-hmm. us mm-hmm. because I did enjoy working together, and I was, um, you know, I, I've you've you've given me a lot of encouraging compliments today, and I promise I, I didn't give him any payment for that <laughs> at all. But uh, you know, I've told you many times I, I I like to surround myself with people who are who are smarter than me, hmm. and I've always felt like you were a very bright young man, and I was always grateful that we got to work together and encourage one another. And, uh, and I always felt, uh, you know, that God was going to do something great. And I think he mm-hmm. is doing something very great in your life and, and in the life of your family, which is, uh, which has c- uh, grown recently. You, you, yep. you, you mentioned earlier, you had two boys when you started seminary and now you have yep. a third. We have a daughter. Yep. Uh, yeah. Almost third two. Yeah. Yep. That's awesome. And, uh, and continuing to serve in the church and, I'm uh, I'm grateful just just so much for for you and and for the ministry that you have there. Well, I'm going to uh, begin. I'm going to draw us to a close here. I'm going to say, brother, thank you for being on the program today for giving insight into this. And um, does he have any final words? Any final thoughts for anybody? No, I think we covered so much of it. I think my final word is, you know, be discipled under a pastor. So, you know, I had the the benefit, the blessing of you being my pastor then. And in God's providence, we cried many tears when we mm-hmm. were separated for a time. But, you know, ultimately you were there uh, at my ordination and God brought me back into the community. So, you know, 30 minutes down the road and uh, I'm grateful that you're still my pastor and still the oh, guy I call oh. when, uh, you know, when I'm working through difficult things. And that perhaps is kind of the final word is the other thing seminary is not going to necessarily provide for you is pastoral friendships and relationships mm. that are going to help sustain you uh, through some of the challenges of ministry. And so you might meet those guys in seminary, but if you're not intentional about forming them in the fires of a church they might not last. And so I'm grateful that God's provided that for us uh, together and I'm grateful for being here with you today. Amen. And yes, I did speak at your graduate or your um, ordination and you got me on a plane for the first time in a long time. I'm not a good flyer. And you this saw is, snow. I did. It was a wonderful, that was, that was a good trip. Got to go to the Louisville Slugger uh, factory. Yep. That was cool. That was cool. Well, gang, thank you for being with us today. I hope this has been profitable for you. And even if you're not a person who is seminary bound or interested in seminary, hopefully this will give you thoughts about what it takes uh, in regard to being someone who is called to pastoral ministry, Mm -hmm. maybe give you ways that you can pray for your own pastor if you're not a part of our church. And uh, if God is calling you into ministry and you feel that call, and and we would both affirm that, have that call recognized and Mm -hmm. affirmed by your church, Mm -hmm. not not to call yourself into ministry, but Mm -hmm. to to recognize that God uses the church to call men into, into ministry. And if you have questions, please feel free to reach out. Uh, I have an email address that you can email, calvinistpodcast at gmail.com. That reaches me directly. You can send me any question that you'd like. If you'd like for me to expound on something we talked about on the program, or if you'd like to ask Aaron a question, I can forward it to him. So again, it's calvinistpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you, Aaron, for being here today. Thank you, listener, for being with us today, and thank you all for continuing to support the channel. I'm Keith Foskey, and I've been your Calvinist. May God bless you.